Hello, I'm Archbishop Richard Gagnon speaking to you on our Friday report. I'm at the Catholic Center in downtown Winnipeg and welcome to all of you. Thank you for joining us this morning. As you know, the Friday reports are simply meant to share some news from the Archdiocese with our good people in the Archdiocese of Winnipeg. I also welcome today, as I did last Friday, Christian Martinez, our communications director who will join us uh, during this broadcast when we cover some of the questions that have come up since last week. Thank you, Grace, for having me once again on your Friday report here. And uh, we have a number of questions uh, here for you, important things that have come up. But let's start with one thing. So we mentioned last week about Fratelli Tutti, uh, the Holy Father, Pope Francis's uh, third encyclical, and that we would share a little bit about that. So maybe, Your Grace, uh, just in terms of the few uh, first few parts of Fratelli Tutti, what were your impressions uh, of the encyclical? Okay, well, thank you, uh, Christian, for joining us again today. That's just great uh, to have you as part of our Friday report. Uh, I mentioned last Friday in our first Friday report for the fall that we would look a little bit at Fratelli Tutti, um, and uh, we'll do that. I'll do a little bit today, I'll do a little bit next week and the week following and cover the whole encyclical. Of course, it's, a, it's quite a challenge to make any encyclical sound interesting, right? But you know, quite frankly, uh, when you look at this document, which should be studied, it's a document on fraternity and social friendship, which is a little different. Uh, you'll find, uh, if it's studied and reflected upon uh, Christian, that um, Actually, this document is very, very challenging to all of us on many different ways. Now, uh, St. Francis of Assisi uh, was the inspiration, the overall inspiration for the document. And St. Francis of Assisi would say to his followers, he would say, that you should live your lives uh, with the flavor of the gospel. Now, there's a challenge for you right mm -hmm. there, to live our lives with the flavor of the gospel. And so that's what this is all about. And so Pope Francis, you know, he recalls St. Francis's idea of love that trans transcends the barriers of geography and distance and declares blessed all those who love their brothers and sisters. Now, Today, in our country, we have people coming from all over the world, right? And uh, the question of immigration, the question of refugees, multiculturalism, all those related questions, very important in Canada. If we reflect on this document, we might find it very helpful in terms of this over overarching challenge that we have to St. Francis of Assisi. It is very important that we are able to love our brothers and sisters, those that are near to us and those who are far away from us. And so it is the simplicity and the joy of St. Francis that inspired Laudato Si, mm. the document on creation, his love of creation. You know, St. Francis would call the wind his brother, the sea his brother, the sun his brother, and so on. And so that joy and that simplicity inspired Pope Francis in writing Laudato Si. It's very beautiful. At the same time, St. Francis of Assisi would recognize that even though he felt close to nature and God's creation, he was even closer in a certain sense with people of his own flesh and blood of other human beings, right? And so now we have a little bit about the power of this encyclical, uh, the love of our brothers and sisters, be they far and be they close. And so the Pope writes, for example, that wherever St. Francis went, he sowed seeds of peace and walked alongside of the poor, the abandoned, the infirmed, and the outcast, the least of his brothers and sisters. And quite frankly, uh, when you look at Pope Francis's life as Pope, or when he travels around the world as Pope, there are the official engagements he's involved in. But there's other things he does that don't always make the papers. Mm. Little side trips to visit prisons, to visit people in particularly uh, difficult circumstances, the poor and the sick. It's very much part of this Pope's whole charism 
and it's rooted on St. Francis, in the life of St. Francis of Assisi. So having said that, you can see where we're going with this. Mm -hmm. the, if we pay attention to this encyclical, it has a lot of challenges for us. Now, there's an iconic episode in the life of St. Francis that many of us have never heard about. This is very important, and it's important, important to Pope Francis as well. In the year 1219, in 1219, <laughs> in Egypt, during the Fifth Crusade, a time of tremendous bloodshed, and war. Little Pope Francis and his close friend Illuminatus, just the two of them, no money, no resources, Illuminatus knew a little bit of Arabic, that's all. They traveled together to Egypt in the middle of this war and they went to see personally the Sultan, the Sultan of Egypt, Palestine, and Syria. And that Sultan's name was Malik el Kamil, mm. and, and St. Francis got to see him in the middle of this war. And St. Francis wanted to share with the Sultan about the life of Jesus Christ. Amazing. The Sultan received him. He recognized in Francis a holy man mm -hmm. and Illuminatus. A whole week Francis spent with the Sultan. Mm -hmm. The Sultan was not converted to Christianity, but he sent Francis away with resources, and Francis made his way back to Italy. But Francis became very sick with trachoma, which was a great pain and sickness that he suffered for the rest of his life during that time. But this encounter with the Sultan demonstrates a culture of encounter with people totally different than ourselves, and a culture of dialogue. You see where we're coming from here? Mm -hmm. And that iconic event in the life of St. Francis set the stage in the Pope's mind to develop an encyclical uh, on friendship, on social friendship, and, from, uh, and with uh, fraternity with our brothers and sisters. Now, St. Francis instilled the same spirit of encounter and dialogue with his followers. He told them in his rule not to enter into arguments with people, but to listen to them and to love them. Because when we love our neighbor, indeed we enter into the love of Almighty God. Oh. So Pope Francis says, issues of human fraternity and social friendship have always been a concern of mine, the Pope says. He says, in recent years, I have spoken of them repeatedly in different settings wherever I go. Mm -hmm. We know that. We know that. So, in Fratelli Tutti, mm -hmm. Fratelli Tutti meaning brothers all, brothers and sisters all, words of St. Francis of Assisi, there's two individuals who live today who inspired Pope Francis in writing this encyclical besides St. Francis of Assisi. The first one is Bartholomew I. Bartholomew I is a 270th Archbishop of Constantinople. He is the Patriarch of Eastern Orthodox Christians. Bartholomew has a very deep and close relationship with the Pope, mm -hmm. even though he's not a Catholic. He's an Orthodox Patriarch. Bartholomew I has written incredible works on the environment and the fraternity of human beings and their relationship with the environment. And in Laudato Si, it is the first encyclical in history where the Pope, a Pope, has mentioned and referenced an Orthodox patriarch. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, quite, it's quite amazing. That was historic, right? Your Grace, uh, the relationship between uh, Pope Francis and the patriarch uh, Bartholomew, uh, that was a historic relationship that they had? The, the, a relationship that developed over time mm -hmm. uh, because of the openness of Pope Francis and also the, the character and openness of Bartholomew. So Bartholomew was an important person, a contemporary person. He's still Archbishop of Constantinople, modern-day Istanbul, right? Mm -hmm. The second person, and this is interesting, in 2019, the Pope went to Abu Dhabi in the United Arab Emirates. And he spent time 
with the Grand Imam Ahmad al Tayeb, who is the Imam of Al Hazar, the most prestigious seat of learning in the Sunni Muslim world. And both of them signed a document wow. together. And the document they signed was on human fraternity for world peace and living together. And the Imam commented on Fratelli Tutti. He went to Rome to meet the Pope when Fratelli Tutti was published. Mm -hmm. And the Imam says, my brother, Pope Francis's message, Fratelli Tutti, is an extension of the document on human fraternity and human friendship that they signed in Abu Dhabi. He said it reveals a global reality in which vulnerable and marginalized people pay the price for unstable positions and decisions. It is a message that is directed to people of goodwill whose consciences are alive and restores to human restores to humanity consciousness and so Fratelli Tutti develops the great themes of this document signed in Abu Dhabi between Pope Francis and this very important Imam in the Muslim world mm -hmm. so that sets a little bit about the importance of this document, well worth a read. And by the way, uh, Christian, in our Catholic schools, uh, the documents that uh, Bartholomew has written, and this particular document that comes from uh, Pope Francis and the Imam, are worth studies, mm -hmm. are worth to be studied by our students in our Catholic schools, because mm -hmm. they're very rich documents. Mm -hmm. Finally, the last thing I will say today in giving you a background uh, to Fratelli Tutti is that when the Pope was writing this encyclical, his third encyclical, Fratelli Tutti, COVID happened. Mm -hmm. COVID-19 came and dawned upon the world. And COVID, in Francis's mind, Pope Francis, it demonstrated our false securities in a powerful, powerful way. He says, besides the ways that different countries have responded to the crisis, their inability to work together became quite evident. Despite, he says, our hyper-connectivity, we witnessed a fragmentation that made it more difficult to solve problems that affect all of us. Mm -hmm. And so, COVID-19 itself has provided difficulties and demonstrated to us those difficulties that we have between peoples and between cultures in the world. And so the Pope says, he says, anyone who thinks that the only lesson to be learned was the need to improve what we were already doing or refine existing systems and regulations is denying reality. Wow, very powerful. Very powerful. And then he goes on to say, this is my final little reflection here for today, and thank you very much for your patience, is that what is required today is a rebirth of a universal aspiration to fraternity. Mm -hmm. Interesting, isn't it? That is very and interesting. And the document deals with that, and I'm telling you, it's very challenging to all of us. I was kind of uh, drawn by the word rebirth. You know the word rebirth, we're all familiar with the Renaissance, right? Renaissance, rebirth. It's a time of great flourishing, a rebirth. There's need for a renaissance in fraternity today. Mm -hmm. It's been augmented by COVID-19. But there's many other trends today which have and are making fraternity and social friendship more and more difficult today. Mm -hmm. And so that's what the encyclical deals with. Mm -hmm. So as we proceed in the two weeks ahead of us, We'll look at that encyclical in two very brief summations of some of the chapters in it. So, and I thank you, Christian, for bringing up that topic because I was not really going to uh, necessarily talk about that in our Friday report. But you know, it's a good thing to do. Yeah, it happened to coincide with the, um, the beginning uh, of our Friday report again, Your Grace. And uh, you mentioned that Fratelli Tutti's. Uh, really rich, it's challenging. So from your perspective, Your Grace, how has it been received so far? Because as with all challenging texts, it's, 
it's not accepted right away, you know, so. Yes. Like well, I think that's why we're, we're sort of mentioning it verbally on the Friday report. Right. But like a lot of encyclicals, it takes a long time to filter through. First of all, we have to read it, take time to read it. And in, mo in most people's experience, reading encyclicals is not the normal thing they do. Mm -hmm. But my job is to encourage people to do that and to have time to reflect upon that. So it'll take time for this to seep out, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, we are not islands unto ourselves. We exist within communities and we rely on communities to help us move forward. That comes from the encyclical. Mm -hmm. And I would say, Christian, that during COVID-19, when we think about our parish communities, they are communities. We need those communities. There must be a rebirth of our communities to help us all move forward. And with saying that brief statement, presents a tremendous challenge to us actually and how our synod will apply to that well there's a challenge right there mm -hmm. given the fact that the COVID now has dawned upon us mm -hmm. right yeah thank you for that overview of your, your grace and uh, for our uh, uh, listeners again uh, as well for our audience the uh, encyclicals available on our Archdiocesan website so yes. you can access it there and we have much to unpack so for future finder hey, reports uh, that's we great continue Okay, Your Grace, so we're going to switch gears here a bit. Um, many of our questions right now actually revolve around this topic. Sure. Uh, on October 13, uh, you published a memorandum uh, entitled COVID-19 Clarifications, and it had uh, two um, main sections here on the use of masks mm -hmm. and also the definition of a faith gathering or uh, a religious service. So if you could uh, give us an overview of your memo, perhaps beginning with the use of masks. Okay, well, the memo that was issued October 13th uh, was a result of further uh, consultation with the provincial government. Uh, uh, we have been uh, moving in that direction where there's more and more consultation, and, and I think the provincial government uh, has appreciated that, and we've appreciated it, because, you know, the uh, faith communities have a special uh, sort of nature, as uh, many different communities do and so there's special needs and practices and so on and so uh, that was very very helpful as far as the masks are concerned as you know currently to the end of October and we don't know if that'll be extended or not uh, we're under a code orange which makes it particularly a little bit stricter than normal and so we certainly have the practice uh, throughout the archdiocese where masks at religious services are uh, required to wear a mask. Uh, we have that habit here at the Catholic Center. Uh, I think generally throughout the Archdiocese this is the way it is. Outside of Code Orange they're highly recommended and I find anyways that most people even outside Code Orange areas vast majority of them wear masks when they go to religious services. Mm -hmm. But it is mandated, um, you know, within the archdiocese uh, in those areas, such as the city of Winnipeg and surrounding areas that are under code orange. And that's really a matter of, of uh, protecting others and also ourselves in that practice. It's becoming more and more accepted, I think. Mm -hmm. It's good, a good thing. Yeah. You mentioned uh, in your memo here, you agree, the second paragraph, uh, um, wearing of masks is not required uh, for children under five, persons with a medical condition unrelated unrelated to COVID-19, so someone with asthma, for instance, difficulty of breathing and, uh, yeah. and allergies, and uh, persons with a disability and or movement impediments, mm -hmm. preventing them from removing a mask without the help of another uh, person. That's so correct. We, make, we made an effort to identify uh, this. What was kind of the reason for that? Rivers? Well, obviously, I mean, there's, there's different situations and one has to consider that, right? I mean, the whole idea is for safety for the general public, safety for our people attending religious services, but there are a minority of people in certain cases where the wearing of masks is quite difficult to do. And so we take that into consideration. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Another area here, Your Grace, um, is uh, the um, definition that our provincial government has on a faith gathering. Uh, there's a little bit of a clarification here uh, that we've received from the official uh, provincial government liaison. So can you tell us a little bit about that, uh, how we understand faith gatherings? Yeah, well, that's like you say, uh, Christian, uh, the results of our further clarification with the provincial government, which is very, very helpful. So 30% of uh, occupancy uh, allowable in, in a space, in a church, for example, is, is the normal practice for religious services. 
but the clarification has come what comprises religious services. And uh, so we've listed a number of things in the memo that have to do with that. Eucharistic adoration, for example, in the church, recitation of the rosary or the Divine Mercy Chaplet, for example, 30%. Lectio Divina practices in parish churches, 30%. Catechism classes in the building, in the hall, wherever they may be, 30% of occupancy. RCIA gatherings, 30% faith formation sessions, Bible studies, all of those things, anything to do with our faith that has that as a goal and a purpose, uh, then the general rule of 30% occupancy would apply to all of them. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, people will find that helpful to know that. Mm -hmm, absolutely. Um, that's a major development, I think, that, uh, that was good to note. Um, the last note here, are you, Grace, finally, uh, with public gatherings, uh, weddings, funerals, and baptisms, uh, those uh, under code orange, uh, so in the Winnipeg Metropolitan Health Region, mm. remain um, presently limited to 10 people yes. uh, for attendance. And uh, beyond uh, the capital region, mm -hmm. it's more than that. But, but that's difficult for some people, but uh, there it is. So what yeah. do you say about that? Well, I think it, when it comes to funerals, you know, you know, some of the parishes have quite a few funerals. Um, and it is difficult, obviously, because uh, funerals, uh, weddings, they encompass families and friends, uh, which is perfectly normal and perfectly appropriate. However, uh, the difference between uh, funerals and weddings, for example, is that often it's a practice for people to come from a wider area to that service, out of province even, for example. And also, it is uh, the kind of celebration where there is likely to be more personal contact with people hugging and kissing and so on, just due to the nature of the, uh, of the event, be it funerals or, or weddings and that. And so that does present some particular distinctions be, uh, from the normal Sunday celebrations. Under Code Orange, given, given that situation, uh, the numbers of people attending is limited to 10, you know. And is it hard? Yes, it's very difficult. Um, uh, I had the experience myself a few months ago when I buried my brother-in-law in, in a parish in Greater Vancouver. There was very few people allowed in the church, and I recognize that. But uh, once again, uh, I think there's a rationale to it, and uh, we're called to... Uh, uh, to be uh, faithful to those uh, protocols, as long as the code orange remains. So, Your Grace, uh, we've also been uh, talking about uh, the effects of the pandemic, which, of course, are ongoing. So, uh, for the Friday report uh, today, just to touch on one uh, one aspect of that, which is our finances. And uh, um, working in communications, I hear a variety of perspectives, people, for instance, who think that there has been no effect at all uh, to the finances of the churches uh, this pandemic. And then there are people who are very, very worried uh, about uh, our financial situation. So could you just touch on that a little bit, please? Well, thank you very much. Yes. Well, I think, uh, yes, that's very, very true. Obviously, um, uh, there has been a, a pretty powerful um, financial impact uh, on, on the church in Winnipeg as other dioceses as well. Uh, last spring, uh, from March, uh, March and, and uh, up to maybe June or so, uh, there was a 60% decline um, of revenue in, in, in our parishes, which was quite substantial. And uh, at present, we're at 40% down. So therefore, I encourage people to, uh, to think about that and to see what you can do in supporting your parishes. Uh, that's very important. Um, the few parishes that have a general practice of, uh, shall we say, a direct deposit into the parish, into the bank uh, for their par parish donations, uh, have been doing that for a number of years. Uh, they have they've experienced much much less hardship that way. So that's one one possible way, but not the only way. Um, so I would encourage you to think about stewardship and supporting your parish and uh, to help us to rebuild our communities. So I would say it's a reality we all need to be aware of. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you for that, Your Grace. Uh, final year, Grace, uh, so our live streams uh, for the Sunday Mass at uh, St. Mary's Cathedral are still on. So 11.30 a.m. Uh, and this uh, coming Sunday, you'll be presiding? At, uh, yes, I plan to preside most Sundays uh, at the Cathedral, as we've done in the past. And uh, we precede that with the Rosary praying for the intentions of the Holy Father, for our country, and for many other intentions as well. So I certainly invite uh, everyone uh, within hearing distance of this Friday report to consider uh, the live stream uh, Mass from, the, from St. Mary's Cathedral, as well as the Rosary. But I'm also very pleased to learn that many of our parishes also have a live stream uh, service for their people, and that's great to know that. So that will continue. Having said that, though, Christian, I think that it's important to remember that we must do what we can to come to Mass, even under these difficult situations. Even if it's once a month or twice a month, depending on what the availability is in our parishes, right? Very important because live streaming, the digital world, the virtual meetings, all these things, they're good, but they're a supplement to the actual being present together. Uh, especially at the Eucharist. Well, there you go. There's the reminder from our Archbishop. And so uh, thank you again for our, um, for our audience. And if you have any questions for the Archbishop for the Friday Report, please uh, let us know uh, through our various uh, social media platforms. You can also go on our website or email us uh, at the Communication Services Office. Thanks again, Your Grace. Thank you, Christian. Well, thank you very much for joining us uh, again on this Friday Report. And... Um, We'll conclude our time together uh, with a final blessing here today that God may bless you and your families and keep you safe during these challenging days of the pandemic. The Lord be with you all. and May God bless you and keep you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.